Well, here we are at the end of the Reset series. This is the final week of this eight-part series. And so I'm going to quickly recap where we've been so far in case you weren't here for any of those segments along the way. The big idea of this series is that we're being challenged by God to drop everything, to just come before the cross empty-handed, drop everything. All of our likes, all of our preferences, all of our agendas, all of our possessions, all of our ideas, all of our wants, all of that. Just drop it all and say, Lord, I'm willing to only pick up what you tell me to pick back up. Everything else I'm going to leave at the foot of the cross and I'm going to walk away from it. I want a factory default reset from you, my creator. Reset my life, Lord. So that's what we've been talking about. In week one, we talked about the incredible value of God's relentless love for us, that he pursues us with a love that is beyond comprehension. He has a plan and a purpose for our life. He created us for a reason, and he wants us to know him. And so he pursues us with this relentless love. And we said that scripture is clear that we should love God in return, and that we should love one another in the way that God has modeled his love to us. So that's what we talked about in week one. In week two, we talked about our need to connect, to reconnect with the sacredness of God, sacred, holy. We said God is holy. He is entirely different than everything and everyone else we know. We said holiness and sinfulness cannot coexist. Holiness by its very nature will always destroy sinfulness. And so we need to take the holiness of God seriously and treat it respectfully. And we also said God has called us as the body of Christ, as believers, as followers of Jesus to be sacred as well. As he is holy, we are supposed to be holy. That's what uh, the Old Testament says. That's what the New Testament says. Then in week three, we talked about how do you do that? How do we live a life of holiness? And we said we start with God's definitions of sin, not our definitions of sin. And we said that God's definitions need no revisions. If God says it's a sin, then it's a sin, period. And we should not do it. So the process of becoming more and more holy, more and more sacred, we said it's very simple, it's very straightforward, and yet we admit it's kind of challenging because our will is continually struggling to be in charge instead of allowing God's will to be tantamount in our life. And so as we interact with the Holy Spirit, as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, he leads us to conviction. And we said conviction is when the Holy Spirit convinces us of the truth of our actions, that the things we're doing are based on our will. They're sinful things, not based on the will of God. We're convinced. We're convicted. Next comes confession. We confess. We agree without any caveats, without any excuses, without any reservations. We agree with the Holy Spirit, with God. Yes, that is a sin. And yes, I am in fact doing it. I am sinning. And we feel remorseful about that. We recognize we're wounding our relationship with our holy, sacred God by engaging in unholy, unsacred things. And so we feel remorse for that and we confess it. We agree this is a problem that I need to fix. And then we repent. We start to fix the problem. We change our ways. We change our thoughts. We stop doing that sinful thing. We allow the Holy Spirit to have more and more control in our life and therefore we become more and more holy. Holiness consumes us from the inside out. Our will is replaced by the will of God. Then in week four, we started talking about the five biblical purposes of every loving and sacred church. This is what God intends for the church. The first few weeks, we talked about a reset of our personal life, and then we shifted to a reset of our church life. And we said, we're going to start with fellowship. That's the first of the biblical purposes. Purposes. We talked about how every church, every individual follower of Jesus Christ is supposed to be characterized by what Paul calls the fruits of the Spirit. This is the things that will be produced in your life if you are truly filled with, directed by, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Things like great love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness 
and gentleness and self-control. We said we should be living in complete unity and in complete harmony with one another, being gentle and kind and loving at all times. This was one of Jesus' final and most urgent, heartfelt prayers before his crucifixion, that we would live together in perfect love and perfect unity and perfect harmony with one another at all times. And scripture says, if we do this, this thing alone will lead people to become followers of Jesus Christ. As the unbeliever looks at the church, if the church is truly functioning the way the Bible tells us to, they'll look at us and they'll be struck by how much love we have for one another. And they will long to be part of a loving community like that. They'll have never experience that kind of love anywhere else in their life if we're doing it right. And as a result, they will want to be followers of Jesus as well. Then in week five, we talked about evangelism, and we talked about how each of us needs to be intentional about spreading the good news of the gospel to our friends, our relatives, our associates, and our neighbors. I, I uh, sort of abbreviate that as our friends. It's frangelism. Our friends, our relatives, our associates, and our neighbors, right? And we started with the scriptural mandate that says to be an effective evangelist, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right before Jesus left to return uh, to heaven, he said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be my witnesses. And he talked about all the different places around the world that we would be empowered to be evangelists for him. So when we really focus then on how to be being filled with the Holy Spirit every minute of every day, we become powerful evangelists for Jesus. If we're truly filled with the Holy Spirit, we cannot help but go witness and evangelize for Jesus because that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And if he is in complete control, we are going to feel compelled to talk about Jesus with people that we meet. We don't have to worry about what we'll say because he will be the one speaking through us. That's what scripture says. And then in week six, we talked about service. And we said the Bible is very clear that every single Christian should be serving in the body of Christ, in their local church, in some fashion. And we talked about the Protestant Reformation concept of the priesthood of all believers. And we talked about uh, those who had a Lutheran background, right? You recognize Martin Luther, who said that we should start calling all Christians priests because all Christians are priests. And we said that we're all separate but necessary parts of the body of Christ. We each have different gifts and abilities and personalities and passionate interests. We all have different life experience, different networking connections, different kinds of knowledge. We're all uniquely made by God. So we all have a specific niche to fill within the ministry of our local congregation, and we should all serve them because we are a necessary part of what God's trying to do here. Especially if we become a member here, part of our membership vows were actually to serve in the way that I'm describing. And so we handed out some little green cards for you to fill out and to volunteer to serve on one or more of our ministry teams. And we were mentioning that we're only asking for a once a month commitment right now. If you would just serve at least once a month on some ministry team in our church, that would make a profound difference. We're not just a handful of people are having to do all of the work and potentially getting burned out. So some people responded, many people did not respond. I'm going to urge you to do that again today if you haven't done it already. You are needed for us to reach our full potential and for us to fulfill the vision that I believe God has given me uh, for this church. And then last week, in week seven, we talked about discipleship. And we said Jesus gave us this sort of working definition of discipleship. What is discipleship? The Great Commission tells us. Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So he said, go make disciples, baptize them, make them part of the fellowship, part of the family, teach them to do everything that Jesus taught us 
to do. It's kind of a mixture of all those other things we talked about already. Yeah, we need to be a person who already does what Jesus commanded us to do. We need to be a spirit-filled follower of Jesus. We need to go evangelize people, share the good news about who Jesus is and the positive change he's made in our life with them. Help them become a disciple of Jesus too. Believe that he is who he says he is and that he's going to do everything he promised to do, lead them to Jesus, help them make the decision to become a follower of Christ. And then we need to baptize them. We need to initiate them into our fellowship, into the body of Christ. And then we need to love them and really love them like we are supposed to love each other. And we need to establish this ongoing relationship where we continue to teach them everything that Jesus has taught us. And if Jesus teaches us something new, we need to pass that on to this person we're discipling along the way, right? We need to disciple them. We need to make them Jesus learners. And so that brings us up to speed with our fifth and final purpose of every local church and every individual Christian. And it is also week eight of this reset series, our final week. Worship God. We exist to worship God. God. And I've saved this last one for, for this one for last because it's of primary importance to us. We've been talking throughout this series about the purpose of life. That's the big question everybody's trying to answer, right? What is the purpose of my life? Why am I here? What's the meaning of my life? What on earth am I here for? Why do I exist? And Pastor Rick Warren answers this question this way in the opening paragraph of his book, The Purpose Driven Life. I just want to read this opening paragraph. It's not about you, and that's a shock to a lot of people when they read it. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. You cannot arrive at your life's purpose by starting with a focus on yourself. You must begin with God, your creator. You exist only because God wills that you exist. You were made by God and for God. And until you understand that, life will never make sense. It is only in God that we discover our origin, our identity, our meaning, our purpose, our significance, and our destiny. Every other path leads to a dead end. I agree with that 100%. So today we want to talk about worship, and we want to talk about worship that is pleasing to God, because believe it or not, the Bible says there are types of worship that are not pleasing to God. True worship is wholehearted and genuine. It's not just showing up. It's not just going through the motions, because God looks at the heart, not at the outward display. It's like Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well. A time is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit and the people who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. See, there's a tendency for all of us in our worship times to become distracted, right? To start thinking about our to-do list. Or start thinking about where we're going for lunch. Or start thinking about when was my golf tea time? We start thinking about all these other kinds of things. We get distracted instead of giving God our complete attention and focus. There's also a tendency to come to worship as a spectator. To kind of think of ourselves as the audience member who comes to watch or listen to the song leader. Or watch or listen to the preacher do the worship for us rather than fully engaging and worshiping God ourselves. There's a tendency to reduce worship to the songs we sing as well. Over the years, I've heard people describe church like this. Well, first there's a prayer, then we do some fellowship stuff, then we do some worship, and then the pastor preaches for a while, and then there's another prayer, and then we do another worship song. But in actuality, all of these things are worship. 
when they're not all worship for us, it's because we've fallen into the trap of thinking of ourselves as the audience, as the spectators. We listen to the prayer. We listen to the sermon. We listen to the songs. Sometimes people will say, well, I'm not a singer. That's why I don't sing along with the songs. They listen to the songs. Or maybe we sing along with the songs, but we don't really think about the words we're singing. Maybe we're just singing because it's time to sing, but we're not really singing these words as true heartfelt songs, words of worship to God. Instead, God intends for us to fully engage with all of those different types of worship. If we aren't a singer, then we should read the words aloud as a prayer. Okay, you don't want to sing them? Don't sing them. But say the words aloud as a prayer, fully engage in worship. As we listen to someone else praying, we should be praying along with them, agreeing in our spirit with the words that we hear them say that we agree with. Maybe even saying, Amen, God. Amen. I agree with that. I agree with that. While someone else is leading us in prayer, they're not doing the prayer for us. They're leading us in prayer. We're supposed to all be praying together as the body of Christ. Look at what Jesus tells us in Matthew 18. Again, I tell you the truth. If two of you on earth agree about whatever you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are assembled in my name... I am there among them. Also, when the preacher is preaching a message, be actively engaged. Read the scripture that they're reading aloud as well. Ask God to show you something that he, and he may show you something that I missed. I, it may not be something I felt like I was supposed to share. I can't tell you how many times somebody has come up to me after a sermon and said, wow, that was such a good sermon. I was so shocked when you said such and such because that's exactly what I'm going through right now. And I'm standing there thinking, I never said such and such. I never said that at all. But the Holy Spirit spoke to that person and said that. And it was facilitated through the preaching. That's because they were fully engaged. They were worshiping in spirit and in truth. They were engaging with the word of God themselves, even while I was doing the same. And we all got something different from the moment. If you come to every worship opportunity with this mindset, full of the expectation that God has a word for you today, Every day, there's something in there that's for you. Maybe the whole sermon didn't apply to you, but there's something in there. There's a word for you from God that you have to listen for and engage in. And you'll be amazed when that happens and you'll make a stronger connection to God. It's just like the Holy Spirit took the words of the apostles on the day of Pentecost and allowed everyone in the streets from all over the world to hear the message in their own native language. The Holy Spirit does the same kind of thing in times of worship. If we're worshiping in spirit and truth, God will speak to me differently than he's speaking to you sometimes. We all hear the same physical words, but God speaks to us all differently in our spirits. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? But we have to be actively engaged as a worship practitioner to receive it. We cannot be a spectator. So when you pray, pray with your whole heart and engage your mind as well. Pray in spirit and in truth. When you sing, sing with your heart and engage your mind as well. Sing in spirit and in truth. When you hear the scriptures read or preached about, read along with all your heart and engage your mind as well. Read, study, learn the word of God in spirit and in truth. That's true worship. That's the kind of worshipers the Father seeks, Jesus says. Those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. It was a great worship song that was written during a time when the church of this particular songwriter had lost that focus in their worship. They had become spectators. They had become consumers. They had become audience members. Uh, they were waiting to receive from the band, from the worship leader, from the pastor, rather than giving their heart, soul, mind, and strength in participatory worship in spirit and in truth. So the pastor there did a very brave thing. He said, we're going to take away the sound system. We're going to take away the worship band. And it was a really amazingly, fantastically talented, huge worship band. 
And he reminded his congregation they were to be producers of worship, not consumers of worship. And he asked them this question. I'm going to say this a couple of times before we get done today. When you come through the doors on a Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to God? That's something we should consider every week. When you come through those doors on a Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to God? And so when they did this in this church, after a few weeks, people began spontaneously singing songs of worship a cappella with just their voices. There was no accompaniment at all. There were no musicians. And over the next few weeks, their perspective on worship changed. They stopped thinking of themselves as the receivers during those times, and they started being the givers. They entered every Sunday with this thought at the forefront of their minds. What am I bringing as my offering to God today? And the worship leader at that church is a guy named Matt Redman. And he was inspired to write a song about this experience. I'm not going to sing the whole thing. We sing it here all the time. It's one of our favorites. I'm just going to sing a little bit of it this morning. When the music fades and all is stripped away And I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. If you know it, sing it with me. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. So a few weeks ago, I shared how when the church is engaging in true fellowship, in complete unity and harmony and love for each other, that speaks volumes to unbelievers who witness it, who are affected by it. They feel, they sense the Spirit of God, even though they maybe don't have a name for Him yet or a name for that sensation, yet that emotion that they're feeling. They just feel awed by the power of that experience. They're experiencing true, authentic, original love from the creator of love, from the one who actually is love himself, and they can't help but be attracted. And so remember what Jesus said, I give you a new commandment to love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Everyone will know by this that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. People will see how we love each other in this very uncommon way, and they will have never experienced this kind of pure, straight-from-God love, and they will want to be a part of it. And they may not necessarily be convinced by our words or by our confessions of faith, or by our proclamations, or by our preaching, or by our prayers, but we will eventually convince them that Jesus is real, that he really does love them, and he really does have a plan and a purpose for their life, if they can really sense his love in us and through us. And the same exact thing happens when a whole church actively engages in true worship, when we're all worshiping wholeheartedly in spirit and in truth, when unbelievers come in as your friends, you invite a friend who's not a believer yet, but they've said, yeah, I'll come to church with you, and they come in and they experience true, authentic worship, they long to have that kind of connection with their creator themselves. They're drawn into that experience, and they can make a God connection because of your worship. We want to be God connectors. We want to help people connect 
with God in a way that they've never done before. They feel God in a way that they can't understand. They sense, wait a minute, something's different here. I've never felt this way before. They can't describe it. They can't name it. But if they're honest, they say, I, I felt something. I felt something different. I made a God connection today. True worshipers are God connectors. We help people get connected to God. As we touch God in worship and then we touch somebody else, we're like this conduit of electricity, right? And what we're sensing from God, what we're experiencing with God, we pass on to them, spiritually speaking. They make that connection too. And then if we then explain to them what they've experienced, if we tell them about Jesus, Jesus and his incredible love for them. And we ask them, do you want to make a stronger connection with Jesus as your Lord and Savior and continue to learn more about him and experience that closeness and intimacy with God even more? Very often they will say yes. And that means we've made a disciple of Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do with our whole life. They will become a part of the kingdom of God. Fellowship, evangelism, service, discipleship, worship, all these things work together in the body of Christ to enlarge the body of Christ to fulfill the purposes of God. And that's what Paul was communicating to the Corinthian church. They had become too focused on this one spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. And they had created a hierarchy of who was the most important Christians or who were the best Christians. If you haven't spoken in tongues, then you're not one of the cool kids, was basically their viewpoint in life. And so Paul spends pretty much all of 1 Corinthians 13, 14, and 15, three chapters, arguing against this kind of wrong understanding of spiritual gifts. And when he gets to 1 Corinthians 14, verses 23 through 25, look at what he says. So if the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and unbelievers or uninformed people enter, will they not say that you have lost your mind? But if all prophesy, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person enters, he will be convicted by all. He will be called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and in this way he will fall down with his face to the ground, excuse me, and worship God, declaring God is really among you. So you remember a few weeks ago we talked about what this word prophecy or to prophesy means, and we said the popular belief is that it always means you're going to tell the future or you're going to predict the future. If you're prophesying, you're predicting the future. But it's far more commonly involving something different. This word prophesy comes from the Greek word prophetes. And while it may involve predicting something in the future, much more commonly it refers to simply declaring the mind of God or declaring the message of God. And I shared a few weeks ago that's something a spirit filled preacher should do every single week. But that's not just something the preacher does. It's something we're all supposed to be doing as well. If we're truly spirit-filled, when we follow along with what the preacher is saying, when we listen to the word of God and we communicate back to God in prayer, we ask ourselves this question, how can I declare this message of God in my life as well? How can I declare it with my actions right now? How can I know the mind of God? How can I know the message of God? And that's definitely something we should be doing when we sing along with the songs of worship because they're inspired by, or in many cases, directly taken from the words of Scripture. And as we sing aloud the word of God, as we sing aloud the message of God, we are prophesying. We are prophetess. We are proclaiming the will of God, the message of God. And so then if an unbeliever or a seeking person comes in and hears that and experiences that and realizes this is real. This is real. These people really believe these words because they've really experienced them and they know them to be true. And they really authentically put them into practice in their daily lives. They're not hypocrites. They actually do the things they say they believe. Paul says a God connection occurs. God reveals to that person that he knows them. 
He loves them. He has a plan and a purpose for their life. The secrets of their heart are disclosed. How will this convinced seeker unbeliever respond if we are all doing our part of worshiping God together in love and unity and harmony in spirit and in truth, prophesying with our praying and our preaching and our singing, all declaring the mind and the message and the love of God with conviction and joy and enthusiasm. Paul says he will fall down with his face to the ground and worship God. I've shared with you before, one of the Greek words we translate as worship is the word proskuneo. Proskuneo literally means to kiss towards someone as you bow down. You pay respect or homage. You actually fall to the ground, face to the ground in humility. The Hebrew word shachah has the same meaning. This is the word picture Paul's creating for us here as well. This person will fall down on his face, proskuneo. As he worships God. And Paul says he will also testify. He'll declare his newfound faith. He will say God is really among you. In other words. Wow you Christians aren't just smoking mirrors. You aren't just going through the motions. You aren't just dreamers. You aren't just fakers. You really do have a connection with the creator. And now I do as well. What's happening? This brand new believer has hit their reset button as they make a true God connection with their creator. And it was all facilitated by our worship of God. They become a sanctified, justified, regenerated, new creation, born again, believer, follower of Jesus, a new member of the body of Christ. Look at what Paul, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away. Look, what is new has come. So do you see, do you see how important your worship is? Do you see what you can accomplish for the kingdom of God if you will worship in spirit and truth? How can you be sure? How can you be sure that you're truly worshiping God in spirit and in truth? How can you be sure that you're prophesying as you sing and pray and participate in the sermon? How can you hit that reset button for you? You have to always remember, you are not the audience. You are not the audience. Come to worship with this question always on your heart and mind. What offering to God am I bringing today? You are coming to give. You are not coming to receive. You are not the audience, not even the seeking person, not even the unbeliever who may have entered today in Paul's example is the audience because we're not performing our worship for them. We are all the performers of worship, but we only have an audience of one. There's a great Big Daddy Weave song, and I'm just going to sing a little bit of it for you as we close today. I come on my knees to lay down before you, Proskuneo, bringing all that I am, longing only to know you, seeking your face and not only your hand. I find you embracing me just as I am. And I lift these songs to you and you alone as I sing to you in my praises make your home to my audience of one. You are Father and you are Son as your spirit flows free let him find within me a heart that beats to praise you and now just to know you more has become my great reward to see your kingdom come and your will be done i only desire to be yours lord it may appear to be a semantics exercise but to me it makes a difference when pat and i are up here 
We're not leading worship. We are the lead worshiper in that moment. We're not leading worship. We're the lead worshiper. When we sing, I just sang twice in this sermon. When I sing, I'm not performing for you. Gretchen wasn't performing for you. She was performing for her audience of one. When Pat is leading worship, she's performing for her audience of one. So I'm not looking for praise. I'm not looking for fame. I'm not looking for glory from you. You're not my audience. And I'm not your performer. If my preaching or my singing ever pulls the focus on to me, instead of being directed toward God, I'm failing in my goal. Being a lead worshiper is never a look at me, look at me, look at me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me endeavor. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So would you sing this little piece that I sang earlier? Most of you sang it along with me, this heart of worship. Let's just sing it again a cappella, just the chorus part. And let's sing it directly to Jesus, our audience of one. If you say, Greg, really, I'm not a singer. Nobody wants to hear me sing. Then say these words aloud today as a prayer to Jesus. If you're not a singer, then pray them. Everybody's a prayer. Everybody's a prayer. Let's do it together. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. You guys take it. I'm sorry series of messages, all eight of them. And again, the big idea, in every area of our life, let's hit the factory default reset button. Let's drop everything. Let's kneel before the cross, empty-handed before Jesus, saying, laying down everything, every relationship, every possession, every agenda, every want. I'm laying it all down. I'm willing to walk away from all of it. You, my creator, you tell me what to pick back up. And that's the only things I'm going to pick back up. I want a factory default reset button hit for my creator. Let's do that. Let's just kneel before Jesus empty handed and tell him what tell him to ask to ask him to tell us what to leave and what to pick back up. Restore us to your original design when you made us, Lord. When you saved us, when you called us, when you equipped us. Father God, as we just symbolically kneel before you today, I pray that all of us can follow through with this commitment to really come to you truly empty-handed. No caveats, no restrictions. Open every door, every drawer, every spare room, every attic, every storage shed, every second home to you. It all belongs to you, Jesus. And I'll give it all up, and I'll walk away from all of it today if you tell me to. But if you want me to pick some of those things back up and use them for your glory, then that's what I'll do. So you tell me what's important in my life, and that's what I'll do. If that's the prayer of your heart today, you could say, me too, God, me too. And for those who are maybe here today or listening or watching online later, if you've never begun a relationship with Jesus the way I've described it today, where you feel that you truly know him, that you can talk with him, that you can hear from him, that you can sense his presence and know his purpose and plan for your life, you've never felt that before, you've never known him in that way, then today is the first step of an exciting journey for you. You can say, Jesus, I now have confidence that you are who you say you are. And that you'll do everything you've promised to do. I have felt a touch of your presence today. I've sensed the supernatural around me. I feel like I've maybe made a God.
God connection. I said, Jesus, show me you are real. Show me you love me. I ask you to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Be the manager, the CEO, the director. You lead, I'll follow. I'll stop being God in my life. And I'll allow you to be God instead. Be God. Be my leader. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Forgive me for all my sins. I am convicted of them. I confess. I agree with you. They are sins. And I'm repenting of them. I'm turning away from them. I'm going to live a different life. I'm going to follow you. Lead me in the path of righteousness, the scripture says. Show me who you are, Jesus. Be the Savior of my life. Lead me in the paths of righteousness and give me the promise of eternal life when this life is through. Maybe that's the first time you've ever prayed that prayer, or maybe today you're recommitting yourself to that. And if that's the prayer of your heart, you can say, me too, God. Me too. Father, touch each one here today in the way they most need to receive your connection. Help them know before they walk out of this room that you are real, that you are large and in charge of your universe. And you care deeply about each one of them. And you have a plan and a purpose for their life. That's my prayer for all of us today in Jesus' name. Amen.